Welcome back, Don Cobble, with questions and replies. And we are continuing uh, with the subject of the coronavirus. Why has it come? What can we do about it? And we're dealing with, we, uh, our last class was about the introduction of the doctrine of Balaam. And that is that the doctrine of Balaam to teach God's people that they can sin without consequence and that allows the enemy to overcome us. And the first sin we dealt with was the abomination of homosexuality, lesbianism, same-sex marriage, LD, LQGB, whatever those letters are. These things are an abomination, and yet the church is in support of it, so much so that it is now being invited into congregations. We're ordaining homosexual ministers. We're doing same-sex marriage. These things are an abomination to the Lord and it removes our protection, our shield. It removes God being with us and being our hedge because we are participating in an abomination. Now, the second one that I'm going to go into is the abomination of murder. And you say, well, oh, we know murder. Oh, but no, this is a, this is a different one. This is the abomination of murder of children, and we call it abortion. We call it, actually, worse than that, we call it women's rights. If someone asks you, do you believe in women's rights, what they're really saying is, do you believe in the right for a woman to have a child murdered? Well, I'm going to have to deal with some issues in the Word of God to make sure that we understand this based on conversations I've had with people. And when I'm pushing these two issues, homosexuality and abortion, I believe these are the big two that the church has to turn from. If we want to be able to be victorious when the judgment of coronavirus has come, we are going to have to turn from these two abominations. Now, I'm going to pull this slide up, and I want you to, uh, to be able to see this, because if you're on a phone or something like that, it would be too small, because there's a lot on this slide, but this is what we're going to deal with. And here's the question I get. Is not sin, sin? Why are you repeating the word abomination? Well, the reason is because the word abomination is speaking about sin of a greater magnitude. Now, we're going to go and we're going to read two sections of verses here, Matthew 23, 23, and then Exodus 21, 22. Mac, uh, uh, Matthew 23, 23, let me pull that back up for you. Matthew 23, 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you pay tithe, mint, anise, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Now, this is Jesus speaking. Jesus is telling us something here. He's saying, because they asked the question, should we be tithing these herbs? And Jesus replied, you should be, but you should not have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Wait, wait, what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying every righteous thing that God has told us to do is important but all of the righteous deeds we're to do are not equally important. There are weightier things in the law of God as compared to other things. So he said, should you tithe, tithe these herbs? Yes, but you shouldn't have said, well, since I'm tithing those, I can neglect the weightier matters of the law. Well, what else is Jesus telling us in this? Jesus is saying, I'm the only one that's seen the Father. You've not seen his image. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, but you've not seen his image. I'm telling you about God the Father, the invisible, omnipotent, omniscient creator. I'm telling you that though God has given you multiple commands to do with all types of issues of life, they are not equally weighty in his sight. So some things are weightier in the word of God. Now I'm saying this because when I point out the abominations that are being done in the body of Christ, in the church, people repel against that. They don't want to hear that 
And then they say to me, are you perfect? Do you don't sin? Well, I can say, as far as I know, (laughs) I sin. But as far as I know, I am not walking in an abomination. And I'm telling you, an abomination is a weightier sin than the sins, and this is not making excuse. We're to live upright and be as holy as we can possibly be. And that's my goal and ambition, to be as holy as I can possibly be. But though I fail, and in even, I'll say this, even if I did commit an abomination, I would immediately repent because an abomination is a serious thing before God. And so the church is participating in two abominations. I'm talking that, that people just embrace it and say, hey, this is accepted behavior among Christianity. And the first is the homosexual, same-sex marriage, bringing it in, ordaining homosexuals, or ordaining lesbians and having uh, gay churches. Yes, we're embracing that in the name of grace, but it's a perverted grace. It's a perversion of the grace of God. Should we reach to homosexuals? Yes, but we should not be pastored by homosexuals. The, the, and, and same-sex marriage, it's an abomination. It's against the things of God. And so when you walk in an abomination, you're inviting judgment. But here's the other abomination. I want to pull this slide back up, and I want us to read this. Exodus 21, 22. And this is the one we're going to focus on this lesson because we've already talked about uh, homosexuality and sexual perversion. Exodus 21, 22 uh, through 24. Verse 22. Now, now listen to what God is telling us here. If men fight and hurt a woman with a child so that she gives birth, so this child was in her womb and it's called a child. That's amazing. We call it a fetus, but it's called a child. Now listen, and she gives birth prematurely, meaning that it is caused to leave the womb, yet no harm follows. He, the one who bumped into the woman, shall surely be punished according to the woman's, what the woman's husband imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judge determines. But look at verse 23. But if any harm follows, harm to who? The baby. You shall give life for life. Well, wait, what is God saying here? God is saying, If a baby is caused to leave the womb and then its life is forfeited, it's a death penalty. Now, (laughs) what, what am I saying? I'm saying that is God's view of abortion. And this would have actually been an accidental abortion. And he still said it's life for life, death penalty for taking a baby from a womb and then killing it. Now, I don't know how to get any plainer to support God's view of abortion than this verse. But let me interject right now. If a woman happens to be watching this or a man who's participated, a woman happens to be watching this and and she's saying, oh my goodness, You're making it sound like I participated in murder. You did. Well, you're making me feel bad. That, I don't want you to do what I hope you would do now is go to the Lord right now. Turn to Him, cry out to Him, and say, Lord, forgive me. I did not know. I was led to believe this, or I was led to believe that, or I was under pressure. Uh, I'm sorry. And I ask you to forgive me. Now, you know what he will do? He said, I'll forgive you and cleanse you of all sin and all unrighteousness. But I've got more good news for you. He will not only do that because I know how these abortion clinics counsel and they counsel and tell you that that it's just just like removing a hangnail. You know, it's a a minor surgery. We do them all the time. It's very easy. You, you, You won't even hardly know anything was done. But what they're not telling you is because you're participating in a murder, there is consequences to your emotions, to your soul, to the inner you, the hidden man of the heart. 
So here's the good news. Not that that, that that was done. The good news, not only does God forgive, not only does God cleanse, but you know what else? He will heal you. He will heal the damage that was done to you. I don't mean the physical damage, although he will heal that if that needs healing, but he will heal the emotional damage. So if you happen to be talk, uh, watching this, because when I talk about this, I realize some people have done this and, and they start feeling pressure and guilt and they feel like I'm throwing them under the bus. I'm not throwing you under the bus. I'm saying, amen, if you have done this, repent and then cry out to God and say, heal me, heal me, I wanna be whole. And then never do that again, nor support that view. So I'm more dealing with the supporting of the view uh, in today's lesson, but if by chance any have participated in that, you need to repent. I mean, there's just no other way around it. You need to repent. You need to repent and you need to turn and then you need to ask God to heal you because I am telling you, you're damaged from that. Even if you don't know it, you are damaged from that. So now let's move on to why I, I'm saying this. I'm saying this because I want us to go back and, and go to this slide one more time. In looking at this, what we see is these two primary abominations, and abominations are not low-level sin. Even though people use the term, you know what, let me go back and get, get you. Even though people say sin is sin, that's a lie. Even though sin is sin, that's not what they're really saying. They're saying all sin is equal. All sin is not equal. As there are weightier matters of the law, there are weightier sins. And abominations carry death penalty. Now, I'm wanting us to see the correlation that the church is embracing through the doctrine of Balaam. We're being taught from our pulpits that these are without consequence and that it's okay with God. We're being taught from our pulpits, but I'm wanting you to know that though we, the body, is not to take body members, uh, body of Christ members who get into sin or even commit an abomination, we're not to take you and go out and stone you, but I do want to inform you that though we're covered by the blood of Jesus, persisting in an abomination still carries a death penalty, meaning there will be judgment, judgment to death if these things are not dealt with. So now let's go back and reconsider coronavirus. Lord, protect my family, protect our church. Don't let anything happen to us. Protect your church, your church that is doing same-sex marriage, your church that is embracing homosexuality, your church that says abortion is a woman's right, and you say, well, no, no, I, I don't personally believe that. But here's where the church has the blood on their hands. Many people don't participate in those particular sins, but they are supporting politically. They are voting and supporting politically to keep these false, ungodly institutions in business. Same-sex marriage, homosexuality, lesbianism, and, and, and that they're taking kids and, and putting them through sexual change operations. Children, what is God saying? What is God saying? And not only that, then we, we have the abortion. So, I'm saying this so that we realize, when, and, and, and I'm, I'm responding to the way I get pushback when I bring up these subjects. Because people immediately say, well, are you without sin? Are you without sin? No, I am not without sin, but I'm not walking in an abomination. And if you are, you need to repent. If you're walking in any sin, you need to repent. But if you're in an abomination, you need to repent because that is an invitation to judgment. And this is... These two primary things, and listen, the church has got a lot of problems, but these two primary issues, I believe, were the calling issues, calling, saying, 
We're not going to judge ourselves on these issues. We have embraced them and invited them into the believer's lives. And we have taught a false grace and said it's covered under the blood. Therefore, we could participate in these abominations. And what we didn't know is we were sending little SOS messages out into the spirit realm saying, judge us, judge us, because we refuse to judge ourselves. Now, listen, I'm going to show you, because I'm telling you, people, innocent people, and I realize no one is perfect and perfectly innocent, but innocent people are going to die because the church has not judged itself. Now, I want to pull up this Jeremiah 19, and I want to show you this. Listen, and this is not, this is not a, an indictment against God. God is saying you are playing. You know, if, if you were playing with electricity, high voltage, I would say don't play with that. That can kill you. Am, am I being mean to you to tell you that? No. So let's read Jeremiah 19, and I want us to see something that God has said. And this would, uh, again, supports why I'm saying that the coronavirus is a judgment from God on the church worldwide, and especially here in the West. Jeremiah 19, 4 through 6. This is God speaking of Israel, God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because they have forsaken me and made this an alien place, because they have burned incense in it, this was God's place, to other gods whom neither they, their fathers, nor the kings of Judah have known and have filled this place, this was God's place, have filled this place with the blood of innocence. He's speaking about children. It's going to become very clear here. Shedding the blood of children. Verse 5, they have also built high places to Baal and have burned their sons with fire for burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command, listen, or speak, nor did it even come into my mind. God said, this, something, this is so grievous. This, this thing, something like this has never even entered my mind what they are doing. And so I want us to see this is an abomination to God. And, and we'll see in our next lesson why even voting in that direction is evil in the sight of God. Evil in the sight of God. To vote to support these two abominations as a Christian is an abomination. And it'll bring judgment upon you. We'll see that in our next lesson. But I want to, I want to read the rest of this so that you understand and when people are saying, God, God, where are you? Where are you? Uh, I, people are dying that I know. And he's like, oh, yes. Well, let me tell you why this is happening. So listen to what he says. He, they burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command, speak, nor did it even come into my mind. Therefore, because they're doing these things, therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that this place shall no more be called Tophet or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. Now, let me ask you this, brothers and sisters. Do we want the church in America and America itself to be known as the nation that has become... Let me pull that up so you can see that again. This is the word of God down there. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that this place shall no longer be called Tophet or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. What if God is saying, I have allowed judgment to come upon the church so that they would turn from their abominations so that I do not have to turn their lands into the valley of slaughter so that I don't have to allow the evil one, remember Balak going to Balaam, 
What was he looking for? Looking for a way to prevail against the people of God. Balaam said, I can't curse them, but I can teach you a doctrine. I can teach you a doctrine that if you get them to embrace the doctrine of Balaam, that it is okay to walk in abominations. Balaam said, Balak, you will prevail against them and you can actually turn their land into a valley of slaughter. Now, my brother and sister, I do not believe that this coronavirus is even the last thing coming. I think God is saying, how are y'all going to respond to this? How are you going to respond to this? Now, I realize that these issues are so charged because I, I, I believe me, I hear the, the feedback when I bring these subjects up, but the truth is the truth. And if the church will turn, humble itself and turn from its wicked ways, I believe God will strengthen us again and the spirit of Balak trying to turn us into the valley of slaughter will be stopped. But as I told in a, a, the opening lesson, I caution you to judge what you're hearing from these prophets who say, oh, this is okay. As long as the church just comes together and rebukes this thing, it'll go away. God's going to give us the victory. There were prophets that continued to tell the children of Israel all was well with them when Jeremiah said these things. But those prophets were false. Now, I'm not saying that all these prophets that are speaking peace and safety to us are evilly false. I just think they're misdirected because they've not consulted the written word of God and they have more confidence in what they hear within their heart than they do in what's written. I am begging you, my brothers and sisters who have embraced those abominations, turn, turn from them. And in our next lesson, we're gonna to come to understand why. Even if our turning from those things does not alter what happens in the church, God cares that we care. So again, I encourage you, turn and tell people, turn, church, repent. We need to be right in God's sight. Amen. We'll continue on our next lesson.